Our scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 1. We'll be reading verses 1 through 17, through 14, excuse me. John, chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full. We open again our Bibles to John chapter 1, and I would direct your attention to. Verses 7 through 12. 12 is the main focus um, of this message, but I, I want to read now again John 1, verses 7 through 12, for it to be more fresh in our minds. And then we will be reading just one of the answers again from Lord's Day 7. So, John 1, verse 7. Speaking of John the Baptist, it says, The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. And light is a reference to Christ. That all men through him, through Jesus, might believe. He, John the Baptist, was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. This verse gives us what we could call a theology of conversion. And we are told in, in these few words, looking at verse 12 especially, it tells us that a soul, you, can be saved by faith. We are told that this, this saving faith can happen, this salvation can happen by the power of God. And we are told that to be saved, you must receive the Lord Jesus. There's no other way to be saved unless you trust Christ, unless you receive Him. And in so doing, God gives you power to become the very child of God. And, and this little portion comes in, in this first few verses of, of the Gospel of John as, as the evangelist is exposing something, a, a little introduction of the ministry of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is, is 
the one that's being spoken of in verse 7, who came for a witness. John the Baptist had a privilege no other prophet ever had. We can think of Abraham who rejoiced to see the day of Christ, but John the Baptist saw Christ, not just the day of Christ. And many other prophets were told many astonishing things about the coming of Christ, but they were hundreds of years before Christ was right in their very presence. And he had, he had this privilege to be a witness, not to say he will come, but to say he is here. And you think how astonishing would have been that day that he literally pointed to the Lord Jesus and said, Behold the man, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. It, that very one is the Lamb. He is the sent Messiah. All of Old Testament scripture has been fulfilled in that man. This is why John was surprised when Jesus came to him to be baptized. And John said, I must be baptized by you. And yet in that event of the baptism, we're sealed to John the Baptist that that was the Christ. When the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove and came upon him, John the Baptist had been told that that would be a sign. And then the words of God, that that was his son, his beloved son. So Jesus was about to begin his public ministry. He was going to be seen by all. He was going to be um, heard by many, he was going to be praised by some. And John the Baptist had the great privilege to be the prophet to say, yes, it's him. And it didn't matter to him that people were leaving his ministry and following Jesus. That's why it's, he said that it mattered that he increase and, and I decrease. That's what's supposed to happen. My ministry is one of just pointing people to Christ. And, and John becomes such a wonderful model for every one of us, for every elder and minister, for every deacon, for every Christian. Because this is who we are supposed to be in this world. Not pointing people to us, but pointing people to Christ. And we are like little John the Baptist in this world. Witnesses of the Lord Jesus. Everything we say to people and, and, and when we share about the gospel, this is what we're seeking to do. We don't want followers of us. We want followers of Christ. Proclaiming Christ to others. And when you take that word witness, that means a testimony. It is someone who is in essence like a, someone testifying as in court. Bringing evidence. Bringing facts. Uh, helping the jury to make the right decision of, about the matter. And it's all based on the truth. It's not based on hearsay. It's not based on I think this or I think that. No, it's, it's based on reality. It's based on truth. And when you take that word testimony, God's word had many realities in the Jewish life connected to the word testimony. And these were all testimonies to God. Um, there was the tabernacle. It was called the tabernacle of testimony. There was the veil. It was called the veil of testimony. There was the, the two tables of the law. They're called the tables of the testimony. Or you'll read the law of testimony. And the ark of the covenant was also called the ark of the testimony. These were all objects that were bearing witness of God, showing that God is true. It, the, the pagan mind was confused about that. They would tease the Jewish people that they had no gods because you would enter their temple and where you would expect some giant statue that in their temple would be some glorious figure showing, showing grandeur and some signs of power and strength and whatever kind of deity that was about, about sky, about fertility, about harvest, whatever it was, people would tease saying when you enter your temple you see nothing. There's no statue. There was, of course, the great mystery that nobody could really even go in there except for the high priest once a year. And it was so full of smoke inside the Holy of Holies, they, they could see nothing, hardly the Ark of the Covenant. But the word would go out that, that it was an invisible God in essence. But see, by not seeing a statue, that was the witness of a true, invisible, eternal God. There was nothing that a rock could ever be put into to represent the creator of rocks and the creator of the universe. 
He had to be something unseen by the minds of men because anything that would be visible would just minimize and make him smaller than what he is. That was a witness. And you would open the ark of witness, there would be the tables of witness. And reading those words of the Ten Commandments, it was testifying, this is who God is. He is a holy God. Worthy to be worshipped that way, where his name is not to be taken in vain, and his day is to be remembered, and his person is to be worshipped. We are to make no other images and worship them for God, because they'll never give credit to the true God. And as for all the people he's created, we don't steal from them, we don't lie to them, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't kill them. We don't covet what they have because we love those who bear His image. Because we love Him. These were all testimonies. And John the Baptist was a testimony. And what are you to do with a testimony? You're to believe it. If it's a right testimony, a right witness, you trust it. If it isn't, you don't. And and this brings us then to the theme of faith. I'm I'm saying these things, and and we are in this passage because we're studying the climax of the Christian religion, which is faith. And I say climax in this sense. This morning, we saw the foundation of the ministry, which is prayer and the Word. Nothing exists without it. It's through the Word that we hear who God is. It is through prayer that we commune with God. Through the Word we hear God. With prayer we speak to God. And that starts communion. But how do we relate to what we find in the Word? And how will we pray? It's only through faith. And when we have true faith, then we have that which we saw, which becomes the the ministry of the deacons. Because we trust the Word... And so we're praying to God and asking for help. Our eyes are made open. We become sensitive to the needs around us. And we send like an army of people doing good to serve all those around us who are in need. And we send missionaries to countries that need them and to neighborhoods that need them in our own um, country. Faith. Trust. God's Word says that without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Why? Because without faith, you are lost in your sins. You're not saved. You cannot be saved without faith. And if you cannot be saved, you cannot please God. Without faith, you are still dead in your sins. You have a life that is earthly, but you do not have a life that is spiritual. And you have no hope of heaven. And you are without God in the world. Faith is, is, this is what I mean by the climax of faith. For Christian experience, there has to be faith. Um, Matthew Martin Luther said this, God our Father has made all things depend on faith so that whoever has faith will have everything and whoever does not have faith will have nothing. Now, little faith is already enough to have everything. You you don't have many things based on how much faith. Of course, if you have a lot of faith, you will certainly have more certainty and more security and even more joy. But you won't have more eternity. Even with a very little tiny faith, as small as a grain of mustard seed, you'll have eternity. You'll have Christ. You'll have the Holy Spirit. This is what Martin Luther meant by everything. Even, Even a little faith is already enough to then begin to please God because you already have everything. That's that's how precious faith is. And we do not need faith only to be saved. We, We need to understand this. A lot of Christians stumble right here. They understand the importance, the primacy of faith. They understand they can't be saved without it. Okay, they're saved. And then they think they graduate. And now they're kind of on their own and on their works. And this is how we please God. No, we still live by faith. It's from faith to faith. We need faith to be saved. We need faith to remain saved. If we were to stop having faith, we we wouldn't continue saved. Now, it's not really a problem here because once you have true faith, it never ever will happen. We may go up and down in our faith, but it will never be where you have no faith. 
once you've had faith. But we need to understand that faith is even for, for the strengthening of our lives as a believer and even being able to live as a believer. Let me give you an example of how faith sustained Adoniram Judson. Um, many know how when he was in Myanmar in the day it was Burma and he was in prison for a long time. He saw gruesome violence for a season when he was laying in a foul prison with a 30 pound chain in his ankles. Um, a fellow prisoner asked him sarcastically, So, Dr. Judson, what about the prospect of the conversion of the heathen? And with, he had a sneer in his face when he asked, and the instant reply of Judson was, The prospects are just as bright as the promises of God. And today, um, the gospel is there in Myanmar. So faith is what we're studying today. This is the theme. And let's begin by looking at the knowledge of faith. And then secondly, we'll be looking at the trust of faith. And thirdly, the truth to trust. And the reason we have these first two points is because the verse that we have um, helps us focus upon those two elements of knowledge and of trust. But this is seeking to look, if, if you would want to follow with me, in, in page 34 on Lord's Day 7, when there is the question asked, what is true faith? These are the two um, graces, you could say, or elements that compose true faith. Knowledge and trust. Listen how the Catechism puts it. True faith is not only a certain knowledge, and the word certain here is not meaning like a kind of knowledge, like you could say, well, there's a certain kind of tree. It's, it's not that way. Certain is here in the sense of, of certainty. Not only is faith a, a knowledge that is solid, whereby I hold for truth all that God has revealed to us in His Word, but also an assured confidence. And in, in our second point, when we look at trust, it is a word explaining this confidence. And, and the word confidence explains the word trust, which the Holy Ghost works by the gospel in my heart. That not only to others, but to me also. And these are the things we trust. Remission of sins, everlasting righteousness, and salvation are freely given by God, merely of grace, only for the sake of Christ's merits. Nothing based on our our own certainty, even not based on our own work, on our own faithfulness. No, it is the grace of God. This is what we mean when we say we are saved by faith. It is a faith that becomes ours because God gives it. But it's not a, it is not ours in that it originates in our own hearts. And then question 22 goes on to say, well, what are the things to believe? And we'll be looking at this towards the end of this message and even um, in future sermons. But the knowledge of faith. There seems to be no, no, no misunderstanding there. Many people who understand faith, Christians, they, they obviously would say, of course we need to know. We need to know that Jesus came to the world. We need to know that he lived and he died, that he rose from the grave that he resurrected and he is in heaven now. Um, but a lot of times, because we want to emphasize the second part, which is the trust, we almost have in our minds the thought that trust is more important than knowledge. And, and we need to understand this. See, faith is not two-thirds trust and one-third knowledge. And, and, and it's not like half trust and half knowledge. Faith is composed of knowledge and trust. We cannot think of any one of these as better than the other. What we need to understand is this is how important knowledge is. It is so important that without it, you will never trust. You see, we want so often to go to the trust and emphasize how that's important. Because see, this is what happens. It is possible to have knowledge and not have trust. And so there are people who say, I know Jesus came to this earth. I do not deny it, but I do not want to serve him. 
Well, that person is not saved. And, and the Bible says that the angels, not the angels, the devils believe. See, they, of course, do not deny that Jesus came. They don't deny that he's the son of God. They don't deny that he's without sin. They will lie about it and make people think elsewhere, other things, but they firmly have knowledge of these things, but they have no trust. So see, because we understand this dimension, we, we tend to emphasize the trust as if the knowledge is not as important. But this is why this whole point is focusing on the knowledge. It's the door to the trust. Because what is it that you will trust if you do not know it? There will be no trust. It is impossible to trust something, to embrace something. And in our second point, we'll look at trust itself. It'll never happen if knowledge isn't there. The problem is not too much knowledge. The problem is only knowledge and no trust. And so knowledge is of the essence. And, and just to put the two together, see, to know and to trust is in many, sometimes it is expressed in terms of, of the mind is where we know and the heart is where we trust. Sometimes we speak of head knowledge for knowledge and heart knowledge for, for trust. And think of it this way, boys and girls, when you, when you see a chair, well, you obviously have knowledge about it. You know that it's there. But then when you sit on that chair, you are actually trusting that chair. If you say, I will not sit on that chair because you see it's a little wobbly. See, it's your knowledge of the wobbliness of the chair that will make you say, I do not trust it. You have knowledge, but you don't have faith. There are things that we should not trust. Um, and it's based on knowing, right? Um, you, you can see an airplane, and so you know it's there. But the moment you enter and you take your seat and you buckle the seatbelt and you're literally there and the doors are closed, that proves that you trust it. If you didn't trust it, you wouldn't go in. You see a rope. You're on the cliff. Someone's wanting to help you. There's nowhere else to grab. And you see the rope. That's knowledge. When you grab it and you trust your weight to that rope or yourself to hold it, that's trust. But you see, there would be nothing to trust if you couldn't see the rope. We cannot minimize the knowledge part. It is absolutely essential because there would be no trust. Um, there's a little story about a, a man and a, and, a, and a little son in the days of the World War II and those blitzes that would come over London. And he, with his little boy, ran to the shelter. There had been a bomb not too close to their, not too far from their home, and they knew they needed to take shelter. The father opened the shelter. He ran in and then put his hands up to grab his son and said, Jump, son. And he said, Daddy, I can't see you. And the father looking up, he could see the sun against the, 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 the bombs that would, would show and enlighten the sky. He could see the little silhouette of his son. And he said, but I can see you jump. And the boy jumped because he trusted his father. But he didn't just trust him. He knew. He saw the father going. He had a knowledge. Well, he had to have trust. And the jumping proved it. But you see, would you jump if you had absolutely no knowledge? If, if, if your father went into another shelter, would you dare jump into this one that is dark? You have no idea who's there. Does it have a bottom? You see, there's, it, it, it's crazy to trust something that you don't know. So the knowledge element, beloved, is absolutely essential to the definition of faith. This is, this is always the first part, as the catechism puts it. True faith is not only a certain knowledge, an, uh, an absolute knowledge, a, a knowledge that is solid, that is full of certainty. And, and, and it is that. It says not only that, because it goes further, and we'll do that in our second point soon, but we need to talk about this knowledge because it's often something that we end up just going over really quick because we think that the trust part is more important. Don't think of it that way. Let me show you a place where we kind of betray that this is how we're thinking. We, we are trying to evangelize someone and we feel like we're not coming through and we think no matter what we say, they're just not believing. 
Well, how will their faith begin? There has to be knowledge. The moment they trust is completely in the hands of God. But the knowledge you can give them, see, God is the one who needs to open their eyes to whatever knowledge you're giving them, but they will have nothing to open their eyes to if they have no understanding of what they're having to believe. And so never minimize the verses that you will say, the Bible that you will read and point them to it. Give them knowledge. It doesn't matter that they're blind to it. It doesn't matter that they're not receiving it. They need knowledge. They need to know about a Jesus who came to this world. They they need to know that it was a virgin birth. They need to know that it was prophesied many years that he would come in Bethlehem. They, They need to know these things because this knowledge is what God will use to then have them embrace it. You can't do it. You can't force them to embrace it. But you can give them the knowledge and let God do the work. And the reason there are many people who do not have the trust is because they do not even know what is there to trust. You ask people what they understand about Jesus, and the reason they don't trust him is because they don't really know even who he is. They think he died because he said some things that were wrong. Some people think of his death as it was a mistake, and that's how he finished his battle. He, He lost the fight. Some people even have it misinterpreted and and even written wrong. Um, The whole Muslim world have the thought that Jesus never even died on the cross. That Moments before what they thought would have been his death, he was translated into heaven. And the whole concept of this death is not a knowledge to them. How can you believe that Jesus died if you believe a lie that he didn't die? You need to give them the knowledge. It doesn't matter that they'll say, well, I don't believe that. Well, they need to know. They need to know that he died. They need to know that the Bible says he died. And the Spirit will be the one to enlighten them, to believe that what you're saying is true. But they need to have the knowledge first. So don't ever think that knowledge is good, trust is better. They're both necessary. If one is lacking, there is no faith. It is like one plus one equals two, but one, and if you leave this blank, it'll never be two. So knowledge and trust is faith. Faith, yes, knowledge, even an unbeliever can have knowledge in a general way. So we then start thinking trust is more important, but without knowledge, trust goes nowhere. So knowledge is absolutely essential. Think of a man who is in search of water. He travels to a region because he believes there's a river in that direction. Well, what leads him there? It's the knowledge of the possibility of a river. So he goes. See, his, his going in that direction shows his trust in what he heard. But it's, it's the knowledge that sends him in that direction. Think of a family that is thinking of purchasing a farm. And, and they believe it will be good for their family, but why? See, it's the knowledge. They, they have a knowledge that that location is good, a knowledge that the price is good, a knowledge that they can make a living off of that farm. Well, when they're purchasing and buying and doing all of that, that is their trust. But it was based on their knowledge. See, it wouldn't have gone anywhere without the knowledge Well, think of John the Baptist, thinking of our very text in John the Baptist's ministry. Wasn't his ministry just communicating knowledge? He would see those people, and he would tell them they needed to be ready, and he gave them knowledge. The king is here. You are not ready. Your sins have to to be washed away. And so they were making lines to go and, and be bathed and see people would ask, what do we need to do? And he would tell them, you need to repent. If you're, if you're living a life of immorality, stop. If you are not happy with your salary, you need to be content. And then he saw those Pharisees and he said, you must flee from the wrath to come. He was giving them knowledge. And that's what you and I have to believe. The things that John the Baptist said. We need to believe he is the promised Messiah. He is the Lamb of God. We need to believe that we must repent of our sins. And, that, and trust that Christ will forgive our sins. And, and before we move to our second point. It's interesting to think how what I'm saying is absolutely the norm. 
If you think philosophically of everyone living life, they all live based on knowledge and trust, not just knowledge. Which really brings the reality that everyone lives by faith. The question is, is it faith in the right thing? Faith in the truth or not? And what, what do I mean by this? Um, think of yourself, if you have a job and it's in a company and it's a certain address, what sends you in that direction is that you know. You know you have a job. And you believe it. You trust it. So you get in the car and you go. And, and, you, and you have to understand that when you enter that meeting and when you shake that hand and people are treating you as if you are the one who has that job, all of that reality is something of a knowledge. And, and you're living it because you trust that that's the reality about you. And, and by the way, how did you get there? You, you looked at your car and you trusted it was road worthy for that day. You, you trusted even the conditions of the road. If you have a driver, if you go in a bus, you need to trust that driver. If you don't trust him, if you've heard that that bus driver wrecked five buses, will you enter that bus? And maybe you will find a way to go to another route because you have a lack of faith in that rider. Beloved, the, the whole world was living this reality. They looked outside. They thought it was a little danger. They stayed inside. Granted, of course, many countries, we had to. There was a lockdown, but it hasn't been a lockdown in many places. And how many people have stayed home because they thought, it is dangerous out there. I think it's safer to stay here. I remember during the lockdown when they first opened up and we could go to the stores. I wasn't so excited to go to the stores. Because after a whole month that you don't go in, you start thinking, maybe I don't need them anymore. And I remember going into a supermarket and thinking, is this wise? What if I get sick? I even thought in terms of Christian, like it's materialistic anyway to buy a few things. Maybe I don't need these things. Let me just go stay home. See, I wasn't really trusting the environment. The moment you began to trust, you began to go. People began living by faith. And even when they weren't going out, they were living by faith. They were believing their home was safer. You see, their faith, what they knew and what they trusted, dictated how you and I live. No one in the world lives outside of this paradigm. Knowledge and trust. There will be no trust without knowledge. So our first point is to emphasize the knowledge. But now let's go to our second point, the trust of faith. Now this is to emphasize what we are to trust. And, and also to show the difference between trust and mere knowledge. See, when I say mere, don't think I'm trying to say it's less. I say by itself, knowledge by itself. It's very different from, from the trust the trust goes deeper. It, it has an element, like I said, of heart. It has an element of experience. It, it has an element of... of um, it, it's interesting. This is where I should go immediately to. The figures. God's Word uses so many figures. I, I believe it's, it's a lot like forgiveness. Forgiveness has a lot of figures in the Bible because God wants us to understand it. We can't miss this. It's too important. And when you think of faith in terms of trust, there are many figures. And, and these figures help us. They, they help us understand. The word trust has the figure um, of tasting. Um, Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And you, and you think, well, taste. Of course, this is a metaphor. How can I taste the Lord? And the very next phrase says, blessed is the man who trusts in him. And so the psalmist is saying, to taste is to trust. And, and so if we want to understand trust, the word taste is there. Um, think of food then. Here's a beautiful plate. You have knowledge of that plate. You can smell it. And so you have an idea it must be good, but you will absolutely have no idea of how good until you taste it. And it will do no good to you. It will not nurture you until you taste it. And, and the... The metaphor of tasting carries on with the words eating and drinking. 
And if I put together the word coming also, because I want to read John 6, 35. Notice this verse brings faith as a figure. I mean, brings these words as a figure for, for trust. Eating, drinking, and coming, coming to Christ. John 6, 35 says, I am the bread of life. So Christ is already using a figure, calling himself a bread of life. He that cometh to me, see, coming to him as this bread, shall never hunger. So, of course, it's the idea of coming to him to eat. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And the word believeth here becomes the clue word. All of these words, come to Christ, eat of him, drink of him, is to trust in him. You notice this, this of course, is that part when we look at these little analogies. I see a chair, I know it. I sit on it, I trust it. I see an airplane, I know it. But I'm only going to trust it if I enter in and and look at the driver, the the, the pilot, and and entrust my life to his hand. Of course, it's to God and all his providence that it will make it a smooth flight. Another figure for For trust, we saw this this morning, it's the word obedience. Remember when we were seeing how um, after the deacons were ordained and and the fruit, the results that the gospel went forth, and it says, and many of the priests became obedient to the faith. What does that mean? They believed. They trusted. But of course, it wasn't just in their heads. It wasn't just that they knew. Now they knew. They're the ones who crucified Jesus. They knew a lot. But now they trusted their lives to the Lord Jesus. Of course, when we think of trust, it makes us so exciting because it completes the full definition of faith, knowledge and trust. And someone could say, but how could obedience be a figure for faith? If faith is a gift of God, like how can I obey and have faith if he's the one who needs to give me faith? And this can confuse some people, but we, 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 use, we go by what God's word says. I gave you Acts chapter 6 that speaks of those priests who became obedient to the faith. Romans 16 verse 26 speaks of the obedience of faith and perhaps the most clear passage that connects your believing with being obedient is 1 John 3.23. And this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. See, Apostle John is saying for you to believe is, is, is not left for you to choose or decide or, or even wait. As long as you don't believe, you are in disobedience. The moment you believe, that was an act of obedience. To trust is to obey. And now, I've seen all of these words. I want to go to the word that is in our very text, the word received. Because in verse 12 it says, but as many as received him. See, that's another figure. And so to come to Christ, to taste, to eat, to drink, to obey, these are all figures of the trust element of faith. And in verse 12, we have one more. But as many as received him. Now you could ask, what does it mean then to receive? What helps us here is to understand what it isn't. And, and we have in verse 11, those who did not receive. Look, he came into his own, and his own received him not. What did that look like? Well, we know that Judas received him not. So to betray Jesus is to not receive him. We know that Annas and Caiaphas received him not. So to condemn Jesus is to not receive him. And so on and so forth. See, there are those who hear of Jesus, and they do not receive him. They do not welcome him. They reject him. What is it to receive? It is to welcome Christ. It is to say, Christ, I agree that thou art who thou declare thyself to be. To receive Christ is to accept him. It is to to receive him in terms of what he says and what he proclaims. It is someone who would say, "I, I will Give assent. I will consent to the truth 
that you will be teaching. I, I agree. I concur. I will subscribe to it. I, I will acquiesce. I will embrace it. Um, Calvin says it in a very heartwarming way. He says, faith is not a distant view, but a warm embrace of Christ. So the trust, the tr- I need to read the point, the trust of faith. And thirdly, our third point is the truth to trust. I know I don't help with the points that can make it kind of confusing, but the, the trust of faith is showing this element of confidence. The knowledge of faith is showing the element that we should know. But what is it that we are to trust? What is the trust? What is the truth that we are to trust? And notice this is exactly in our catechism where they go once they have spoken of the knowledge that we should have and then of the confidence. They they call it an assured confidence. Then in question 22 is, what is then necessary for a Christian to believe? What, What truth? What am I to know and to embrace? And this is then what we have to understand. When, when we come to the Apostles' Creed, and, and we'll look at it more in detail because this is what the next Lord's Days will be. So today we won't go to them. The very next Lord's Day we'll look precisely to the Apostles' Creed. Today I'll just keep to my text of the two truths that are here that we are to trust. But I want to say this. First of all, it's everything about the truth. Everything in Scripture is what you and I must know and embrace. Now, as we study Scripture, we do find certain things here that, of course, they're not what will save someone or not. Like, if you know where Egypt is in the map is, and you find a Christian who doesn't know where Egypt is, that doesn't mean that that lack of knowledge will, will impair their confidence. That's, that's not what I'm meaning. But this is why we have such documents as the Apostles' Creed, where basically that, that is the, one of the most simple, downright brief documents showing what the cardinal doctrines are. The word cardinal meaning the most important about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, and about the church, about eternity, about what you and I as Christians experience, like the forgiveness of sins. You need to believe these things. It, it, we're not, it's not like we study the scriptures, we have a knowledge, and we say, well, this I will trust, this I won't. This I will trust, this I won't. We can't do that. We, we don't have that freedom. That is what modern Christianity is doing. And it gets to a point where it's no longer Christianity. Especially when they get to these cardinal doctrines and they take some of them out. That is happening. Um, and the churches are falling by the wayside. The ones that do. Because it gets to a point where you, you have no Christianity left. But I want to say everything about Jesus, first of all. Because Jesus is the doctrine of doctrines. See, He's the one whom the Father sent, who should be the object of your faith in order for you to be saved. There may be certain doctrines that you'll never learn until maybe seven, ten years into Christianity, but you will be saved already if you learn of Christ and who He is. And what he's done. And it's everything about him. You need to believe in a full Christ. You you must bow to Jesus as regards his blessings and as regards his commands. You must receive the crown as well as the cross. You, You need to receive the glory and also the suffering that comes with following Jesus. And this is why when when we invite people to trust in Christ, we need to be very Honest. We are not promising. Yeah, we do promise that there is forgiveness of sins. There is heaven. There is eternity. There's such glorious things to be trusted and and, and waited for. But we also say that you might lose your life. There may be persecution. There's still places where if you go as a missionary, your life is completely in danger. 
It, it's astonishing to believe that there have been already a handful of pastors in Canada who have gone to jail or were threatened that they were going to go to jail for holding worship services. So we need to be honest and say, if you want to understand what it means to be a believer, you need to be ready to suffer for Christ. That's what it means to believe in a full Christ. And then two things directly in our text, our, our, our text that show this reality, this dimension. In verse 12, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. That phrase, sons of God. So when, when you look at that, you understand, so if I believe in Christ, I become His son or His daughter. He becomes my father. Look at that reality right there. The reality of the fullness of what that means and implies. To receive Jesus is to receive this gift of sonship. And so it's a great blessing to be received. And many people would like this. But it also means to receive God as a father. And so a great reverence that is due to him. See, it's everything. It's the blessedness of being a child, but it's the reverence and obedience that is due to a father. And, and so much more, a heavenly father. So as a child, you are entitled to all the privileges of sonship. But as a child, you're also indebted to all the duties of respect. Are those the two things you desire? That's what it means to trust in Christ. And then another word is the word born, a phrase. This comes from verse 13. Born of God, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John, the, the apostle, is going even behind and saying these people who believed and who became Christians, they were born of God. This is what we mean when we speak of being born again, of being receiving regeneration, where, we, where we're giving all the glory to God, that He's the one who birthed us into this newness of life. But all of this is encouraging. It is blessed to receive Jesus means you, you, you were born again. That means you have a new life. You, you, you have eternity. All those things are good. But it also means to live a new life. It also means to live unto him. You can imagine someone who says he's a Christian. Is he born of God, but he is living just like the world? You were, you were dead in your sins, and now you're still living in it. But you're trying to tell me you're a Christian? Yeah, I believed. I believed that Jesus died. I believed that he rose from the grave. I, I believe he went to heaven, and I believe I'm saved. And I believe I'll never lose my salvation. And, and, but you also believe you can continue living in that life of immorality? Well, God is gracious. He's, he's merciful. He'll forgive me. But how can you be born of God and be living as you're born of the devil? You see, it's someone who's not understanding what he needs to know and what he needs to trust that it has to be everything. Yes, we believe in forgiveness, but we believe in the doctrine of sanctification. A true believer is being sanctified. And it's one thing for you to be struggling in your sin and just on your knees and asking people to pray for you and going to God's word and never satisfied that you're, that, that, that you're still not like Jesus. That is the life of every believer. We're always seeking to grow and we're always grieving that we're not there. But see, this is exactly someone saying, I was born again and I want to live as born again. See, he knows and he embraces everything. And as we go and as God gives us, um, and guides us and blesses us, we, we hope to, to go through the Apostles' Creed that shows in detail the truths that we are to know and that we are to embrace, that we are to be mindful of and that we are to trust because that is what faith is. And may God always help us in this, always focusing. There's this little danger that when we look at all these doctrines, 
Christ gets shuffled in, be, in the midst of it all. No, Christ is the center of it all. It is trust in Him, in His person and work, that will even enlighten your eyes to understand everything else. Without Jesus, we have nothing. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious and glorious God, we thank Thee for Thy Word. We thank Thee, Lord, for the Heidelberg Catechism and how it explains faith and all the doctrines so well. We thank Thee, Lord, for the ministry of John the Baptist and for the ministry of the evangelist John to speak of him. We pray, Lord, that he who was a witness to Christ would continue to witness Christ and even among us, Lord, that, that there would be eyes opened to he who is the light with a capital L, that their souls would be enlightened, that they would be saved, that they would have the knowledge now and the trust that they may confess it. We thank, Lord, of those who would be shortly among us confessing faith. We pray, Lord, that Thou would bless the conversations the elders have, have had with them. And we pray, Lord, that soon we may have them professing their faith among us, sons and daughters from some of us. And we thank Thee, O Lord, for that great blessing. Be with all our young people and older men and women. Lord, Thou knowest those who have not yet um, been truly saved by Thy grace. We plead, O Lord, that thy word would search their hearts, pierce, Lord. And when there is a wound, that thy Holy Spirit would, would heal it with the truth of Christ, that there would be this knowledge and this trust in Jesus. And we thank thee for the gospel, for thy Son. In his name we pray. Amen.